Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. This is our open line program in which I invite back a former guest. In fact, our guest, this is essentially his fourth Journey Home program. He's, he's been two times on the regular and one time on the round table. And he's a favorite guest, Deacon Alex Jones, former Pentecostal pastor, presently uh, deacon, uh, committed to evangelization. We're going to talk about all that in a moment. But I want to remind you that you are uh, an important part of this program. So if you want to give us a call, uh, you might want to start calling immediately to get your calls and emails in line because I know there'll be a lot of people asking Deacon Jones some questions. Uh, the phone number is one 800 221-9460. Outside North America, you can call at the regular number, 205-271-2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Deacon Alex, welcome back to the Journey Home. Thank you, Marcus. Good to be back. My it, fourth time. It is. <laughs> and it, you're a seasoned guest, and, uh, and I, I think I was asking you earlier before I asked you to tell your story that right now you're still doing a lot of traveling and speaking for the Lord, right? I mean, that, a lot of missions, a lot of conferences, and television. Tell, well, that's great because it, in one appearance in an hour you can reach a lot of folk. Yes, yes. I, I mean, that's the beauty of it. And if I could, I'd like to send a lot of greetings out to those people who are watching, especially uh, to the Sukar family in Australia that treated my wife and I so royally as we were guests <laughs> in their home. All right. All right. Uh, what I normally do in this episode, we're, as soon as we get lots of phone calls and emails, I want them to ask you questions. I mean, that's okay. fine. I'll just stay out of the way. But I, begin by letting the audience know a little bit of a reminder about what brought you into the Catholic Church. I was raised as a Pentecostal, and uh, for 59 years I was a Pentecostal. Um, for about 25 of those 59 years, I served as a pastor of two parishes. <clears throat> One was the uh, oldest Pentecostal church in the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. and the second one was the one I founded, Maranatha Christian Church, and I pastored that for about 18 years. Mm -hmm. And it was really good. I really enjoyed it. I wasn't looking for truth. I felt that I had truth. I wasn't looking for the Catholic Church. Uh, I wasn't looking for anything but retirement, because I serve... Uh, <laughs> For, for many years. But it was through a Bible study that I had challenged my people to be a part of, in which we would go back in history and look at the early Christian church, how it worshiped. And what I, we, when we went back into history, there were the church fathers. Hmm. And in reading the church fathers, slowly, very slowly, my eyes began to come open as to what happened to the church that it didn't fall off the edge of the earth after the last apostle died, that it didn't apostatize from the teachings of the apostles, but that it grew, and that it grew in the understanding of itself and the understanding of its message and understanding of, of its mission in the earth. And uh, discovering that, the journey began. Two years later, I came into the church <laughs> with 54 of my members. See, that still always amazes me. It, it, the audience, I work with the Coming Home Network International. The reason we exist is to help clergy on their journey into the church um, because of the issues that arise through the conversion of a clergyman. Mm -hmm. You've got marriage, you've got kids, you've got connections, you've got vocations and all that. But rarely do you see clergy able to bring with them their congregation or even parts of it. Right now we're seeing the Anglicans opening the door for that mm -hmm. through the for the Anglicans, but even they're not aren't too many of those really common, and we'll see that happen. But talk a bit about that, uh, in the sense that how hard it is when you're studying early church fathers, you're reading the stuff, the people in the pew who have a lot of their own formation, stuff, the baggage they bring with them, they don't always get to read the books. They don't always see in the stuff. That's why it's often hard for the clergyman that's going through the journey to really convey that to his congregation, to his wife, to his kids. It was difficult, but I realized that just to understand these truths, as I'd come to understand them, and to understand the linkage of the church with the church fathers and the subsequent development of the church, even though I understood that, my people needed to hear that, even though they chose not to follow me or uh, not to agree with me. And so I asked their permission, can I share with you what I've learned? 
and they gave me permission. So for about six months, I taught about the church, I taught about the development of history, I taught about uh, Mary, I taught about papal authority, I taught about liturgy, I taught about Mary, I taught about uh, purgatory, I taught about Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Mary was a big problem to oh, us. Oh, sure, of course, of course. Um, you've been a Catholic for nine years and uh, deacon, and I know we talk about a few things on the program, so there'll be some questions that people can ask. I'll say, go get the archive. But one thing I've noticed is that, experience it myself with other clergy converts also, after you've been in the church for a while, it's, you're still starting to discover what it means to be Catholic. It takes time. You cannot become a Catholic in eight months. As, as good as RCA is, you can't really comprehend the depth of the faith in eight months. Yeah. It takes years of, of being familiar with, of exercising what we take by faith when we first come in. Okay, if the church teaches it, I believe it, although I don't really understand it, but I believe it. In time, your eyes begin to become adjusted to the yeah. teachings of the church, and they become even more beautiful. So many people have asked me, uh, since the priestly scandals have broken out in the last few years, are you sorry you did what you did? I said, no. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it in a heartbeat. Yeah. Because now I'm growing. Now I understand. Uh, it, it's just phenomenal how much I'm understanding and growing in faith and in uh, the love of Jesus and the love of his church yeah. and the love of the people. I am just blown away by the universality of the church. It's diversity, mm. being able to travel around the world and see Catholicism in Africa, Catholicism in Australia, Catholicism in the islands, Catholicism in America, Catholicism in Canada. It's just a, just a great privilege to see how vast the church is. You mentioned Africa. Yes. You've been there. Four times. Because all we hear about is it's just, it just exploding there. It's, and it's what's... I just have to tell you this, and I'll try to make, say it as succinctly as possible. Uh, I was invited by Archbishop Cyprian to come to Martyrs Day in Uganda. Uh, I think it was about oh, two years Martyrs, ago, wow. uh, June 3rd. And he asked me to come and to share in giving my story to well over a million people in attendance. Um, people came from miles away, walking. Some 30, some 40, some 100 miles, walking. When they got there, there was no place to house them because there were about a million of them. So they sat outside in the open air. And uh, that night, it, there were just torrential rains that just poured down all, all on the people. They were soaking wet. There was no place to go but just to sit there in the one piece of ground. And do you know what they did, Marcus? They sang. <laughs> all night long, you hear them singing, <laughs> praising God. They really, genuinely love the Lord. And I found out something. If you, want to see, if you want to see the church in its greatest wealth, come to America, because God has blessed us. We are a prosperous nation. If you want to see the church in its orthodoxy, go to Rome. Mm -hmm. If you want to see the joy of worship, you go to Africa. <laughs> there they dance and they sing and they praise God and they love their church. They love the Holy Father. They love the Blessed Mother. They love everything about the church. Yeah. And there were over a hundred million Africans who are Catholic that, and growing. You are um, committed to evangelization. That's what you do. I mean, you're a deacon evangelization. And, and sometimes when I think about the history of evangelization in the history of the church, it kind of reminds me of trying to squeeze a water balloon. You know, if you've got a water balloon, you squeeze it, and you're trying to all of a sudden, it'll, some, part of it will pop out here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so you're trying to push that in, and then it'll pop out over here. And, you know, when the Protestant Reformation squelched it over here, Our Lady of Guadalupe popped out over here. And we're seeing different countries of the world where the straight faith was strong, and it's down, but it's popping out in Africa. I mean... And in South America. And in Asia. Wait a second. And South America is good to hear, because we don't hear good stories about South America very much. Yes. Church is, gro church is growing. I, I know there's a problem in Brazil with the Pentecostals, but in other areas of, of uh, South America, the church is growing. How, what kind of a message you can give to our viewers about helping the church grow where they are? What about evangelization? What, what should our viewers do with evangelization? Evangelization is not much understood by uh, many Catholics. 
they equate it with uh, Protestant evangelism, which they see on TV, and of course they say, that's not me, I'm not going to do that, or they equate it to going from house to house and neighborhood uh, surveys and uh, census taking. Uh, but in truth, evangelization has always been a part of the church's uh, purpose of existence. We exist in order to evangelize. Mm -hmm. Three ways we evangelize. One, we evangelize by our lifestyle, living a life of Christian love uh, and holiness. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we, we evangelize by reaching out to others in works of mercy and helping those who are in need, works of charity. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, we evangelize by simply sharing our faith, what our faith means to us, that our our church, our, our worship, our, our beliefs are a, a source of comfort to us that takes us through our trials and tribulations. Just those three things. Yeah. And you, the sp- faith will begin to spread. Uh, another topic I want to bring up, because I see we're already getting lots of emails, and that's good. I still want to hold those back, because I want to make sure you and I have a <laughs> chance to talk about a couple of things. I know something else that not only opened your heart to the church, as you just mentioned a while ago, but has continued to be deeper for you is the study of the liturgy. Yes. I find it fascinating. How did, how, how, how did we get to where we are now in, in our liturgy? How it was formed? Now, I, I began to study that when, at the beginning of my conversion, I went back in history, began to read how the early church began to grow in its liturgy. But I want to know fully how it, grow, how it grew to what it is today. And not just Western liturgy, but also Eastern liturgy. I find it fascinating that in our worship, we encapsulate the sacrifice of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. with preaching and with reading and with the sacraments. It's just amazing. And that grace is given and that mm-hmm. Christ is present and that everything that happens. I, I was preaching two Sundays ago. And I shared with the, the congregation, even the colors we wear have significance. I mean, this is ordinary time, which means that it's time to grow. It's time to learn. It's time to hear the wisdom of God. And so uh, I've, I've begun, or I will begin, studying liturgy more in depth this fall at uh, St. Cyril and Methodius uh, Seminary in Orchard Lake. Got a two-year scholarship. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Fantastic seminary. Well, let me, I'm going to ask you for a moment to uh, to put aside your Catholic cap and trying to remember what you thought about when you were a Pentecostal preacher. When you read the words, when Jesus said, abide in me and I in you, apart from me you can do nothing. When you talk to your congregation what it means to make sure you're with Jesus, apart from me you can do nothing. To abide in Jesus. From your Pentecostal background, what did that mean? How could you help a person know in a Pentecostal way how you abided with Jesus and how he helped you live out your life? Well, to us as Pentecostals, abiding in Jesus was simply being obedient to him, following his words, his commandments. Okay. Uh, and that way you ab- abode in him. Yeah. See. And uh, then he and us, and then through that, that, that relationship, we would be able to be successful in our spiritual journey, overcoming temptations, of uh, spreading the word, getting the word out. But basically, as Pentecostals, abiding always meant obedience to our so Lord. So the issue of obedience to his word, following him, um, and asking for his grace, you know, the Holy Spirit empowering you. From a Catholic perspective, this connects with liturgy. Well, as a Catholic, we abide in him as the people of God. Uh, we are part, we're in the church through baptism. That brings us into the church. That relationship is nurtured through catechesis. Um, when we fail, we are restored through the sacrament of reconciliation. And just being in the body through our baptism, we grow when we hear, when we're challenged, when we receive the sacraments, when we receive the Eucharist, we abide in him and he in us. And in that same sense, we are being transformed by the power that not only comes through the hearing of the Word of God, but also through the Eucharist. It transforms us. I think that the importance of liturgy, the importance of the sacraments, you know, I don't stand in judgment of those outside the church. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. But I want them to have the sacraments. And that's why I'm here. I wanted the whole ball of wax. 
I wanted it all. I understood it, and I wanted to be a part of it. What would you say if you look back to your Pentecostal friends? I'm, I'm assuming you had at least one Pentecostal friend that didn't like what you did. I have four. Okay, four Pentecostal. What was their biggest problem with you becoming Catholic? I would think leaving the tradition I was born in, leaving the Mm. faith of the fathers, and going to something that is completely alien to us, that we knew nothing about and didn't want to know. Uh, As an African American, it was a white man's religion. I was wondering if that was... Oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. It was a white man's religion. We had our own religion and we were comfortable, it was culturally satisfying to us. Why would you leave this? When you have such freedom to go over here where you're nothing and you're not gonna be treated fairly and all of this mumble jumbo and Christian calisthenics, standing, kneeling, genuflecting, all that, so unnecessary. All of these traditions that are gonna hamstring, why would you do that? That was the biggest, biggest problem. Yeah. Why would you leave freedom and your cultural heritage to go over here to something yeah. that's totally different. Yeah, which, I mean, underneath that is a, I don't want to point fingers at the black community by any means because it's, you know, I can't do the old, you know, right, you know, I mean, the three point back to yourself. Because I'm sure that the white communities feel the same way about that this is our tradition. You well, know, you, and it's a man made thing, though. Well, do you understand? You, you, you come from the Protestant uh, background. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you understand that the most yeah. segregated hour is at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Protestant. Yeah. That culturally, we like to flock with our own kind. Right, right. So I, I was deflocked. Right. But the, and I agree. But I was going to say, it's even a, when I think about uh, underneath that is this idea, you don't see the idea that we're creating a, a tradition that's comfortable for us, whether it's the black community or a, a, an ethnic community or whatever. We're not giving a religion that God gave us. We're making one ourselves that we're comfortable and we can be free in. And Well, this is the way yeah. they looked at it. I, yeah. uh, we thought, well, we didn't make the world the way it is, but this is the way it is. So we have to learn how to operate within okay. its, yeah. its strictures yeah. and yeah. within its nuances and with uh, its demands. So that's what we did. We created our own church because very often we were not allowed to worship with whites and therefore we were uh, forced to to form our own. So once we form our own, it became ours. And uh, for me to leave that, to become part of an institution was almost unthinkable. Makes all the sense in the world. And and I guess my, my point is just to say that the problem's us. You know, we've we've made it that way whites you know in america and, and we 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 need to take responsibility for that but even the church i mean i don't mean the church but we in the church have not lived out the gospel message to those that are different from us the way we're called to do that well marcus as you well know society puts for a pressure <clears throat> on people of faith and there's always a a, a pressure to conform to societal norms so that even though the Catholic Church in its formal teachings did not agree with slavery and condemn slavery in its formal teachings, right. yet realistically in its societal uh, level of existence, it, it became part of the slave problem. Yeah. So yeah, we, it's just a fact of nature that society puts pressure on people of faith and very often people of faith conform. I think, I don't remember when I learned the phrase, but I wish I could remember because I still think to this day it's one of the most important phrases. The little phrase, but for the grace of God go I. To me, helps us understand how to live out Christ's love for other people. But for the grace of God. When we see the most heinous criminal, but for the grace of God. Go I, right? I mean, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, God's grace, we responded to it. Every man has free will. Yeah. And by God's grace being uh, given to us, we responded to it. And responding to that grace 
keeps us from doing a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, but of course, we have the ability not to respond. Just like I had the ability not to respond to uh, coming to understand the fullness of faith as it subsists within the Catholic Church. I had, I had the ability to say no. In fact, my wife told me, say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I said yes. So we have to respond to God's grace through our free will. Yeah, but Newman, in a lot of his writings, especially his letters, when he would write to Anglicans who were struggling with the journey, would sometimes say, don't let this moment of grace pass you by. Mm -hmm. And sometimes God awakens us, but then like Peter walking on the water, we let too many distractions. Absolutely. And really, I mean, that's, I mean, you had to face that because like you said, you had some tension from those closest to you that didn't want you to say, yes, but this is a moment of grace. I recognize that this was, I had to move and then move her in a hurry. Not to have moved at that moment, uh, the, to hesitate might have been uh, deadly. Mm. But I felt the urge to come, like an invitation, come. And I responded. We've got an email. Um, Geraldine from Ohio. Deacon Alex, have you ever given any thought to becoming a Catholic priest? Since you are a, <laughs> such a gifted preacher and so deeply spiritual. God bless you, Geraldine. <laughs> Geraldine, God bless your heart. <laughs> yes, I've thought about becoming a priest. In fact, I asked uh, the bishop in my archdiocese twice, <laughs> and uh, the bishop said no. Well, he didn't say no. The Catholics talk in a whole different language. <laughs> he didn't say no. Had it been me, I would have said no. But uh, he didn't say no. He simply said, typically, married men serve the Lord and the diaconate. I said, okay, but I want to be a priest. <laughs> then second time, typically married men serve the Lord in the diaconate. Then I said, this guy's telling me no. <laughs> 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 so I said, okay, okay. If God had wanted me to be a priest, I'd be a priest. I mean, yeah. this is his church. Well, That's why I'm here. It's his church. Right. If he wants me to be a priest, then he would open doors because, ironically, one of the pastors that came into the church with me, uh, another pastor in another diocese, is a priest yeah. with a wife and three kids. Yeah. Yeah. And, and today he's pastoring a little small parish, rural parish, in the diocese of Lansing. So it, it, my ordinary said no. His ordinary said yes. Yeah. So. But that is a, a part of... Uh, of our learning to understand the Catholic understanding of the call mm -hmm. versus what we understood the call as in the Protestant world. Because usually in the call was more, I'm hearing this call of God. I want to get it confirmed, but still I'm hearing this call of God. Where in the Catholic Church, it's, it's community. It has to be recognized yeah. by others. Email from, uh, or did a phone call? No, we got an email. Jonathan, Oklahoma. Hello, Marcus and Deacon. Deacon, how did you interpret, no pun intended, the purpose and usage of tongues in the church as a Pentecostal as opposed to the purpose and usage of tongues from a Catholic perspective? Thank you, John. Well, uh, we felt that tongues were a gift, and they are. Yeah. As a Catholic, I say that the gift of tongues exists today. In fact, I was quite surprised when I entered into the Catholic Church and found Catholics that did speak with tongues. I, 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 that's, this is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I came into the Catholic Church to pray, you know, very, but to hear the people that are expressing the love of God and speaking in tongues, and it was wonderful. So, uh, uh, the Scripture, St. Paul says in the Scripture that uh, the Holy Spirit gives charisms, and one of those charisms is the gift of tongues. Right, right. And he said in uh, about, on the one hand, desiring prophecy mm -hmm. and gifts of tongues, but all must be done decently in order. So you have this balance. I was a Presbyterian. We were just all into the decently in order oh, stuff. You, 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 <laughs> you were the frozen chosen. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it's another stuff. But then we had others across the street that were all on this side and, you know, yeah. no order or anything. But in the church, if you look at the teachings of the church, they try and keep that balance, you know. The, well, it is balanced. I mean, when, when I've gone to charismatic conferences, the, the most devoted people to the Catholic faith are charismatics. I mean, it, it just blew me away. I mean, the, 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 their allegiance to the church, the allegiance to their parish, the allegiance to their priest, it's just wonderful. 
So a lot of people yeah. think that once you become charismatic or speak with tongues, that's going to lead you into some kind of la la land, you know. But no, they, they, they develop very deep devotions to the church yeah. and to Our Lady. I mean, it could. It could. It usually, but it could lead away. It away. could because it that's where the decency and order, that's yeah. where the liturgy is. What happened in Paul's day? Like, that's why we have 1 Corinthians 14. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's very good. We have a call from Ann from California. Hello, Ann. What's your question for us? Yes, hello. Welcome home, Deacon. Thank You're you. Wonderful. Um, my question is, in the Gospel of Luke, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed and became the spouse of Mary, thereby sanctifying her with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to the highest degree, and given the unique and intense relationship Mary had with the Holy Spirit, my question is, wouldn't that make her the most Pentecostal mortal human being <laughs> in the Bible? And also, because of that, can Pentecostals embrace her as a role model? Thank you. What a wonderful question. <laughs> I like to shake up people everywhere and I say, you know, the original Pentecostal church is the Catholic church. And guess who was in the upper room with the apostles and the 120? Mother Mary. She was, the, she was the only one there who had any experience with the Holy Spirit. And I like to sometimes in my uh, preaching, a teaching, I like to say that, you know, maybe in the second day of their prayers, you know, Thomas got a little feeling. And Mary said, that's not it. Just keep on praying, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, uh, and you know, uh, Mary has, has not only uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and, and the mother of God, if Pentecostals had only just a fine tweaking on who she is, uh, they would readily accept her. Do you know how I gave my, or, or was able to speak to my people and lead them into the church and get over the Mary issue? In African-American churches, we have usually what is called church mothers or a church mother, which is an older woman that usually is a widow uh, who has gone through life and been faithful throughout life, who's had pain, who had suffering. Uh, in her older age, she's accumulated wisdom and a great depth of spirituality. And so people of the parish or the church, when they get into trouble, they would come to her and say, Mother, I need you to pray with me, pray for me. You know, my husband's not acting right, or my kids are out of control, or I have this condition that needs prayer. They wouldn't come to me as pastor all the time. They would go to the church mother and said, Mother, please pray, because they recognize her experience and her holiness and the power of her prayer. And so I just shared with my people, well, Mary is just big mama. <laughs> <laughs> She's mother of the whole church, <laughs> all Christians. <laughs> and it kind of resonated. They, they understood it. Good question. Thank you for that question. I'm wondering, we're going to take a break a moment before we go there, though. I'm wondering if part of the problem is that, that, that words like Pentecostal and charismatic with a capital P and a capital C bring with them a lot of baggage that distracts us from recognizing what really the fullness of the Holy Spirit means of being a, a full follower of Jesus Christ opens up with the Holy Spirit. Well, well once you capitalize you. the P and the C, then you have, in, you have installed a tradition. Yeah. The Pentecostal tradition, it, it becomes a tradition. And many uh, 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 Protestant churches in their tradition have no tradition. Hmm. And so when you capitalize a, a name, of course, that, that you empower that name. Now it becomes a tradition. Baptist, there is a uh, yeah, Baptist yeah, tradition. Yeah, and there's not just one capital P Pentecostal tradition. There's a bunch of them, a bunch of charismatic different movements. Oh, about 30,000 of them. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break. We'll come back with some more of your questions, uh, phone calls and emails for Deacon Jones. See you later.
Welcome back to the journey home. Uh, our this is open line program, so your phone calls and emails are are a vital part of the program. So keep calling, keep emailing. We're trying to get you in. Our guest tonight is Deacon Alex Jones, and he's got so much to say. But we're going <laughs> to still keep taking emails, and and, and that is going to give us op lots of opportunities to hear the uh, the blessings of his journey of following our, our Lord into the church. Uh, this one comes. This email comes from Jim. Uh, blessings, he writes, Dear Deacon Jones, why did your study of the Church Fathers lead you to the Catholic Church and not the Orthodox Churches? Thank you, Jim. Jim, that is another great question because originally I did go to the Orthodox Church. I read the, uh, in, in the course of reading about the development of liturgy that the uh, uh, St. John and Christosom liturgy, St. James liturgy would be could be found in the Orthodox Church. And so the very first church I went to was an Orthodox Church. And it was in that church that I uh, was introduced to liturgy with the incense. I'd never been to a Catholic Mass. I didn't want to go. I mean, why would I want to go as a, yeah. as a pastor? But understanding the development of Christian liturgy, and this was the old 17 centuries of, of liturgy. So I went to uh, uh, St. Constantine and Helen Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, the pastor there and I were friends because I bought his first church. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he invited me behind the Iconostasian to see the liturgy before sure. uh, the, the people come in, this enrobement and uh, the cutting of the bread and so forth. And I was very tempted to become Orthodox. In fact, to this very day, I love the Orthodox. But uh, in fact, they, they, they offered me priesthood. They said, uh, and these were very powerful men, they said, we know the patriarch and uh, you can become priest. We will make you priest. We will send you to Constantinople and we will educate you and we will make you priest. Please come join us. And I was so tempted because I loved their liturgy. But there was a problem with the chair of Peter. Uh, the Orthodox or the Eastern Church the other lung of the church uh, usually divided along national lines. There is yeah. one chair of Peter that serves all nations. Yeah. And that stood out for me. And I said, well, even though I can't be a priest, I'd rather be under the seat of Peter. Although I love you guys and I respect you guys and I love to worship with you guys, but the chair of Peter is where it is. Yeah. Right. I think when in my own journey, what was bothering me more and more is how you were Pentecostal, me a Presbyterian. We believe that this book was the infallible Word of God, but Absolutely. yet you and I would teach different things based on that book. The confusion that was there that bothered me, and that was what got me to the church. When I looked at Eastern Orthodoxy, I certainly see, saw the tradition, I saw the connection all the way back. But all I had to do was open a phone book under churches, and I saw Eastern Orthodoxy is just as divided as all of the other Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. When it comes to moral issues, when it comes to lots of doctrines, who decides? And uh, I was a Congregationalist for a while, which is not unlike Pentecostals, in that each individual church is pretty autonomous to decide whatever it wants to believe, but votes, right? Right, absolutely. They could have well, voted you out on a Monday and, and, and put the... <laughs> they could have. The, the, the mother in, in charge if they... <laughs> they could have if they wanted to. Of course they could have. Yeah, yeah. That's the risk you take right. in becoming Pope. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the independence of that. And, and but, you know, there was a certain joy in that, too, because you had absolute freedom. I mean, you had absolute freedom. I could implement whatever I wanted to implement, as long as it was along scriptural lines or it was a good you word. You could find a verse. I had to find a verse, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we got another email, Reverend Terry in North Carolina. Hello, Marcus and Deacon Jones. I appreciate your ministry, and I am also on the journey, and I'm facing many of the same decisions that you did. I have found a priest that I had been talking with, but we've not been able to connect for several months. How can I find a priest that will talk with me in confidence, but not push me either? I'm looking for someone who can really understand the journey I'm on. Well, thanks, Reverend Terry. Uh, Reverend Terry, you should talk to this man, Marcus Grodi, because this is why he's where he is. 
to help priests or help ministers come into the church. Uh, you know, I didn't have a priest that talked to me. I think that if I'd had a priest that was a little pushy, I might have become combative. Uh, I did have one person, however, uh, Dr. Dennis Walters, who was the RCI director at Christ the King in Ann Arbor. He came over every Tuesday for two years to talk to me about the church and teach me about what the church teaches and the catechism. Maybe you need to find a, a good, strong Catholic that uh, know their faith and willing to share their faith with you and sit down with them and talk to them. Dr. Walters was just fabulous. T two years, every Tuesday, he came to our house. But, you know, I'm, I'm having second thoughts about that now because he stayed for dinner, and I'm just wondering what for the free. <laughs> um, I appreciate your word of confidence and in, in the, in the work that this is what you're all about, does. Well, I know, and, and it's not even me. All I do is drink coffee. My staff, Jim Anderson and the others, they're the ones that really do the, uh, the work with clergy and a journey. Uh, uh, you know, Rob Rogers and, and the, whole, the whole gang there. But he, I think the, the writer was from South Carolina. Did I say that? I think he said it was South Carolina, North Carolina. But there's one person in your neck of woods in South Carolina that I would also encourage you to consider talking to is Father Dwight Longnecker. Father Dwight is a convert priest. He's a pastor down in Charleston, South Carolina. The reason I say that is he used to work with the St. Benedict's Society in England before he came to, he was doing what we do in England He's very sympathetic to this. I think Father Dwight in your neck of the woods would also be someone you might want to contact. He's got a blog. Just search for Father Dwight Longnecker or come to our website and we'll help you. But like you said, that's what this priest, this, this man on the journey is talking about is exactly why the Coming Home Network had to exist because where can I go and talk with someone that isn't going to push me? And you know, Mark understands the journey. Do you know how many calls and emails I get from pastors who are on the journey? Yeah, it's, it's a there movement. are many, many, many yeah. out there on the journey. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you'll see the it, uh, information on the uh, on the TV screen, on the radio, we'll let you know about how you can come up with the Coming Home Network if there's anything we can do to help you. We have a caller, Mary from Florida. Hello, Mary. What's your question? Hi. It's an honor to talk to both of you. Thank you, Mary. Um, my my question is, um, there are seven children in my family, and my oldest sister is um, is Pentecostal now, and she's trying to, um, in her own way, she's doing it lovingly. She's trying to um, convert me, and I don't know how to handle it. I don't know what to say because I do, I don't want to hurt her. She's very very. Sweet, and she really believes what she's saying. Well, yeah. You Our, know, and she's um, full of love and full of the Spirit, full of Jesus. And um, I don't know how to defend myself because I don't want to hurt her. Mary, that's a good question because I, I think there's probably a lot of people out there who have now siblings and children who've found Jesus somewhere else, right? And yeah, they've uh, undergone a conversion experience. It's just you don't have to be Catholic to undergo a conversion experience. And what they call new birth is really a conversion experience. So what your sister has experienced is a conversion to the Lord, which is good. It's not bad. Like you said, it's, it's a good thing. Fully yeah. authentic. Yeah. yeah, she loves the Lord and the Holy Spirit lives and dwells with her. Uh, but you have to realize, and if you believe this, if you believe that the church that you were raised and born in is the true church, has the fullness of faith, then you should tell your sister, I love you, and I respect you, and I appreciate the conversion you've gone through, and I will never speak negative about that, but I don't want to give up my faith. I will not give up my faith. I don't want to break fellowship with you. I don't want to say anything negative to you. Let's get along, but let's set some parameters right now. And one of the main parameters is, I'm staying with my faith, because it is the faith that comes to us from the apostles. I'm not going to denigrate you or denigrate your faith, but by the same token, don't denigrate mine. Mm -hmm. Allow me to be a Catholic as I allow you to be Pentecostal and just go from there. Treat her with love and kindness. 
That's an excellent comment. I was going to say for somebody to transcribe that and then we'll put it out there on the website for everybody has that same question because mm. that's said perfectly. Mm. Thank you, Alex. Because that really is a common issue. I hear it everywhere I go. In yeah. all the conferences, yeah. someone comes with tears in their eyes saying that a loved one has walked away. How do you get them back? Yeah, yeah. And the, as you said, it almost pre causes us to first be appreciate where they are, mm -hmm. you know, in Christ. Absolutely. It has to begin there. Uh, all conversions to Jesus Christ are good. Yeah. It's the yeah. formation that's bad. We, we want fullness. That's the next step. Yes. We'll get there. Email from Bruce, Florida, Deacon. At what point did you come to believe in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist and what brought you to this belief? Pentecostal? Symbolic? That's how you believed in the Lord's Supper? Well, symbolic might be a little bit too shallow. We believed it was extremely holy. We didn't use words like real presence or the body, the, the true body of the Lord, but we believed that it was true, ho truly a holy thing mm -hmm. and that if you were unworthy and partook of it, you could become ill or even sleep, as St. Paul says to the Corinthians. Um, but we never taught the real presence. So I wouldn't say that it was just a symbol to us. It was, it was so holy to some of our people that they wouldn't take it because they had sin in their lives. Mm -hmm. And they said, I will not take it because I'm not worthy. So we esteemed it very highly. But when I began to read, it was one of the first things I learned, Marcus. Three things I learned when I began to read the Fathers. <laughs> first, the church was not only charismatic, but also liturgical. Secondly, that it was hierarchical. You had bishop, priest, and deacon. And thirdly, and this was the real one that really began me to read and to search, that the church was Eucharistic-centered. Yep. That the Eucharist was esteemed by Ignatius of Antioch to be the flesh of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And I said, What? I said, they, it sounds like he's, he believes this is the real McCoy. And he goes on to say, the heretics do not come and worship with us because they do not believe that Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And I said, wow, the church has always believed this. Hmm. So that's when my eyes began to come open. I could tell you a story, but I don't have the time. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe we can slip it in here, but I've got another email waiting. Becky from Orange County, California. Dear Deacon Alex, when Bible Christians preach that, quote, church is when two or three people gather and there is no need for rites or religion, it's a King James Bible and Jesus, that's all you need. <laughs> what are your thoughts on how to respond to our separated brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, those who feel that way, you can't help them at all. <laughs> Hey, if the King James is good enough for Jesus, right? I mean, well, that's what my that. mother told me, you know, because, you know, even as, um, as a pastor of, of the two parishes that I had, and my mother was one of my staunch supporters. She believed in her son. She stayed by her son. And I believed in using the uh, NIV because of its clarity, sure. because I'm a teacher and I want yeah. clarity. Uh, and so one day she came up to me, she says, uh, uh, says, son, why don't you go back to the King James Version? She said, God wrote that Bible. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. A lot of Christians believe that this is the only version of the Bible. Uh, you can't help them. There's nothing you can say to help them. Um, I, I don't want to use the word extremists, but let's say they are hardcore uh, uh, King James Bible carrying, Bible toting, Bible quoting believers. Let them alone. It's just like Jesus said, let them alone. You can't help them. I know. This. Of course, what's going to happen, you're going to engender an argument. And the arguments and debates accomplish absolutely nothing. All right. Phone call from Kimberly from Massachusetts. Hello, Kimberly. What's your question? Hello, Marcus. Hello, Kimberly. What's your question? Uh, my question for Deacon is, um, I, I was hearing all the time that the, oh. the thing about going to um, confession. As we know, all Catholics go to confession, and we confess to the priest. Now, all other religions seem to think that it's okay to confess to God privately in your room, and that is a good confession. Um, is that something you have a hard time overcoming, Deacon, and to be able to go to a priest and confess uh, any sins for you? Is that difficult, or are you still in that mode of confessing in a bedroom to God. Thanks, Kimberly, for the <laughs> fine question. That's a good question. Um, the answer is simple, no. Um, 
if originally, initially, it was difficult to go to a priest to tell him my sins, but you, as you say so correctly, we confessed our sins directly to God. And I still do that to this day. I mean, if I may get run over by a car before I get to a priest. Uh, but ultimately, I go to confession and confess my sins to a priest to be absolved from those sins. It's not a problem, not at all to me. I think it's a wonderful sacrament that the church has to help us unload ourselves from the burden of the world and the burden of sin. So, no, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think for some on the journey, because they've never done it that way for a large part of their and life, it is difficult. it's, it's the awkward. First, yeah, the first time you do it, you say, I'm standing before this man here. I'm going to tell him I did what? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hey, they look, try to find a deaf priest somewhere. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't speak English. You know? <laughs> I've had people do that. All right, we have an email from Terry. Uh, Deacon Alex, I became Catholic six years ago from a Church of God in Christ background. By God's grace, working through your testimony. By God's grace, working through your testimony. Okay, I read that right. I love the church, the reverent worship, and all its riches. However, sometimes I deeply miss the expressiveness, black gospel-style worship. I remind myself that the Eucharist is the pearl of great price that supersedes all do you ever miss Pentecostal-style worship, and how do you deal with that? God bless. Good question. These are great questions tonight. Yes, I do miss my Pentecostal roots. But remember, I was a Pentecostal for 59 years. I've been Catholic for nine. Uh, <laughs> when I want that good old rockin' faith, rockin' singing, gospel singing, hard-driving, devil-casting-out type of sing, I, I buy tape. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, buy tapes. I mean, that's fine. I mean, you know, and uh, if, if, you, if you want to be more expressive, go to a charismatic prayer meeting. There are tons of them around where you can go and be expressive. But as you said correctly, in the Mass, there's a time for reverence. And that's what we learned when we were kind of simulating the, uh, uh, the Mass as, as Maranatha. Uh, we, we, we learned we could, success, could successfully blend uh, joyful worship or singing with a reverence of Eucharist. And that was one of the hooks that got a lot of my people, that we can be vocal in singing and raising our hands to God, but then there comes a time. Once the homily is done, it's, it's a time now to come reverently before the Lord. Yeah. All right. Let's see. We have a Good uh, question. Great question. How about an uh, email, Elizabeth from North Chicago, Illinois. I'm Argus and Guest. What was the hardest hurdle for you in terms of converting Mary, the saints, etc., and why? How did you overcome it? Good question. None of them. My hardest, the most difficult aspect of becoming a Catholic was you got to realize I was a big fish in a small pond. And I came into an ocean and was a little fish. <laughs> I could deal with that because our Lord, who was in the form of God, did not think it's something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, became human, and became a servant, and died at the death of the cross. If he could do that, I could become nothing within a large pond. But what I think was most difficult for me to overcome is to see and, and, and not feel some type, some tinge of, of, of remorse was the apathy that I found in so many Catholics who were just... Going with the flow. I mean, they weren't excited about their faith. Um, on Sunday, it was a day of obligation. And worship to us and serving Christ to us as Pentecostals was never an obligation. We, we could hardly wait to get to church to praise and worship God. And, and yet I see these, these many, many people who seem to be, and as it seemed to be to me, to be just floating along with the flow. That was very difficult for me. Because I, I, I'm like this. Uh, I was born in the fire, and I can't live in smoke. Yeah. Well, now you're working as a deacon and uh, evangelist. Uh, what's your thoughts about... It's almost like a faith like ours, Catholic faith, and where the physical expression of it is a very important part of our faith. It's not just the internal expression, which is... I would say it's more like my Presbyterian background. Mm -hmm. It's more just what you believe. But the, what we do with our hands and our bodies and what with our mouth and everything is a very important part of it. We, we have sacraments, we do that. 
the danger of that kind of religion is that we can think that that's what the religion is. We can love the form instead of the essence. Love the body, but not the head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the danger. And I've, yeah, I've met many Catholics who love being Catholic, but, but their conversion to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is, is weak. It's easy to get on the train. And just ride. And just, and just ride right along. Right? Hey, you don't have to do anything. Just ride. Yeah. I remember, can I say this, Marcus? <laughs> uh, you know, as a pastor, you have to study. You have to read. You have to prepare words uh, so that you can feed and nourish the congregation on Sunday or, or Wednesday in Bible study. So you spend hours in prayer and you're praying and, you, and, and, and you're reading and you're studying so that your word is a good word. It was such a relief to find out that the church has done all of that for you. <laughs> I mean, with the cycle of readings, with the liturgy, now you can narrow your focus of study. This is what we're going to read about. For the next three Sundays, we're going to read about being ready to meet the Lord, uh, not to be caught up in the details of life, uh, to persist in prayer, uh, to be ready when our Lord comes. That so you can focus on that. It, 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 there's some, what, method to the madness, as yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah. And it was such a joy to me. I said, hey, this has already been done for me. <laughs> I think we've got one more email to slip okay. in here. Tom from Alabama. Dear Deacon Alex, what kind of reaction did you receive from your Pentecostal congregation when you started teaching them about Catholicism? How did they react to it? Well, there were those. I asked permission because I had begun to implement uh, Catholic-like worship in our Sunday morning worship. Liturgy of the Word, Liturgy of the Eucharist. Well, what? <laughs> liturgy of the Word and Liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, and I found a missile, began to follow the readings, the cycle of readings. Uh, found that the prayers were there, began to say the prayers. Uh, people said, Pastor, are you becoming Catholic? And I would respond, oh, no, I'm not becoming Catholic. Nobody wants to be Catholic, not even the Catholics. <laughs> 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 I'm just being apostolic. Um, and so I began to, then I realized that I was indeed becoming Catholic, and I wanted to share the joys that I had uncovered, the faith that I had uncovered. So I asked their permission to let me teach you on Wednesday nights. Not on Sunday, on Sunday I'll preach the Word of God, but on Wednesday nights, let me teach you about the, the Catholic faith. Um, those who said, okay, came, came into the church with me. <laughs> those who said, I don't want to hear it, yeah. they didn't come in. Well, that's, I still think, though, it was a blessing you were able to do that. Cause it's not often the case with men on the journey, clergy on the journey. They often don't have that opportunity or maybe even that comfortableness with their congregation to act on that. Let's say we have a minute or two with the audience here. Any closing thoughts to the audience why they ought to consider making the same journey home you've made? The non-Catholics? If there are non-Catholics watching, and I'm sure there are, if you're on the journey of faith, it's not an easy journey. It's uh, more or less like what our Lord said, that there's no one who forsakes all and follows me will suffer any real loss. There might be some immediate loss of friends, of reputation, of income. That's a part of the sufferings. And this is one of the things I love about the Catholic Church. It gives a great perspective on our sufferings and our needs going without, our lack. That, that it's not a negative, but it's a positive. So I would encourage you in your journey of faith into the church, leave no stone unturned in investigating your faith. Ask all the questions you need to ask. And when you feel comfortable in your heart that this is God's will for you, I want you to make that step. It's not going to be an easy step and everything may not work out well. Everything may not flow smoothly. But in the end, you will find the fullness of faith. All right. Thanks, Deacon. Um, well, mention again that school that's being so good to you right now. Everyone in the Michigan area, the name of the school is St. Cyril, Cyril, Cyril and Methodius in Orchard Lake. It's 125 years old. It's a school that um, um, emphasizes evangelization and good Catholic formation. Check it out on the Internet. All right. Do you have a website? Oh. I have a website. Now, listen to me carefully, because if you mis misspell one word, it's not going to work. www.alexcjones.com. 
If you say DeaconJones.com, you get the football player. <laughs> Deacon Alex C. Jones. Yeah, DeaconAlexCJones.com. All right. Deacon, thank thanks you so Marcus. much. It's always You're a pleasure welcome. to have you here, and God bless you in all your work and for your serving the Lord. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this program. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. He keeps us laughing, but it's serious because this is serious. Yeah. This is about our following of Jesus Christ, suffering, but the graces he gives us as he seeks to draw us closer to him. Be open to him and all that he'd have to give you and the beauty of his wonderful church. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.